Do you notice that the conversations around you are becoming more shallow, less fun and less productive? Well, in this episode, you'll learn why and how you can design for better conversations, making them more human, meaningful and exciting again. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Fred Dust. Welcome to episode 161 of the Service Design Show. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to our brand new episode of the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what are the hidden and invisible things that make the difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is the author of the book Making Conversation, Fred Dust. Fred makes a strong case for the fact that we are having less and less of the hard and important conversations with each other. And that's a big problem. You'll hear why in this episode. Those important conversations don't happen by accident. You need and can design the environment that allows them to emerge. Fred shares some practical and simple ideas that once implemented almost guarantee that better conversations happen around you. And funny fact, you're probably doing already that a lot in your day to day. During this episode, you'll also hear why we should abandon active listening sooner than later and replace it with creative listening. This is one of those things that once you see it, it's impossible to unsee. So at the end of this episode, you'll not only walk away knowing why and how you can design for better conversations, you'll also be able to win a signed copy of Fred's book. Now we're talking. If you enjoy conversations like this that help you to grow as a service design professional, make sure you click that subscribe button and that bell icon to be notified when new episodes come out. That's about it for this introduction. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Fred Dust. Welcome to the show, Fred. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. It's, it's such a privilege to be in a position like I am where I can invite authors of books that I've just read and I'm excited about. So uh, thank you for coming on. We're going to talk about the book, uh, which we'll reveal in a second. Um, but Fred, for the people who, uh, haven't Googled you yet and looked up uh, what your career has been so far. Could you give a brief introduction of maybe who you are and what you do these days? Yeah, so I'm Fred Dust, a um, recent author of a book about how to kind of think about conversation creatively or design designing conversation. Currently, I run a consultancy that actually helps organizations get through or craft the hardest conversations that they're grappling with. They can be cultural conversations, conversations with their consumers, and in many cases, they have focused on large scale global systems change as well. So I've done that, and before that, I was actually uh, I was a former managing partner at IDEO, which is a design innovation consultancy out of here in the US. Hmm. Um, when did you start your own, uh, go off on your own? I left, um, IDEO maybe five years ago. Um, mm -hmm. it was actually, it was related to the fact that I felt like we were sort of seeing in the United States and actually in the state of business in general, kind of inability to kind of grapple with really hard conversations and had been lecturing on the topic. Just to be really clear, I've been lecturing the topic and an agent reached out and was like, we'd love you to write a book on this. So I ended up writing a proposal, writing the book, um, and uh, spent that, about a year and a half researching that. And then on the back end of that, built the business. And so we do everything from working with clients to get through hard conversations to, in some cases, training clients on um, our methods and, and how to kind of use them themselves. Cool. Um, before we dive into uh, this fascinating topic, uh, I have a lightning question round, which I didn't prepare you for, which I prepare no one for. Five questions, <laughs> five questions. Your uh, goal is to answer them as briefly and as quickly as possible. Uh, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Awesome. What's always in your fridge? Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I love cheese. Okay. We have, we've got a cheese lover here. Um, now, this is an interesting one. Uh, which book or books are you reading at this moment, if any? 
You know, I don't read fiction. Or I don't read nonfiction. I read only fiction in my spare time. Um, and I'm reading a book that I can't remember the name of, which is on the side of my bed, which is amazing. It's about like a, it's yeah. Unfortunately, I cannot remember the name of it. But it's really good. Okay, uh, you'll get it. <laughs> maybe Sorry. maybe we'll uh, we'll add the link in the show notes. This yeah. this is <laughs> this might be a good question. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Okay, we're moving on. Um, Leave yeah. the world behind is the name of the There we Sorry. go. There we go. I just needed to give you uh, some no, time to yeah. reflect on that. Yes. Fred, what was your very first job? Well, my very first job uh, was a, a delivery boy for the pharmacy in my neighborhood. So that was really my very first job. Unless, hmm. I mean, unless you're wanting something that's like post, like a real, like a real job. But that was a real job, Let actually. Uh, let's uh, let's do a real quote unquote job as well. So delivery boy, and then what? How how did your uh, professional career start? Uh, I started as working as a um, a designer for a very large retail company, um, and I did that all through grad school. So I worked my way through grad school by working designing uh, old navies, uh, which was for Gap Incorporated. So that was my very first and, job. And design as in graphic design. No design as in uh, space design. So did the okay. uh, architecture and space experience design there. Okay, we need to always label what kind of design people. Yeah, do exactly. <laughs> we really do. Great point. <laughs> um, another fun question: uh, If you could be an animal, which animal would you like to be? Gosh, I've, my dog seems like she has the most fun. I would like to be specifically my dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that doesn't have to do anything with the boss uh, of the dog. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the boss is pretty good, but... <laughs> so. All right. Uh, fifth and a final question. And I don't know if you have an answer to this one, but do you recall the moment you sort of first learned or heard about service design specifically? You know, I don't remember the moment. I remember the era in the sense that um, I was working uh, at IDEO when we had started the service design practice. And I remember working so hard with that practice to make it understandable um, for the world. Um, because, I mean, just because, then this is maybe not a short answer, but because it was so Im embedded in the practices that we were doing as well. We were looking at um, systems change as well as kind of space design. And so service became a natural component. So I, I remember it as a, as a couple of years where we were really kind of trying to make sure people could understand what the method, what it meant. Cool. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, thank you for this lightning rod. <laughs> Somebody, uh, uh, a cheese loving dog. <laughs> yeah, a cheese loving dog who can't remember the book that is by the bedside. Really, it's already makes for a great, uh, <laughs> this is going to be a great episode. Um, so uh, there is a small teaser uh, for the end of the episode because we're going to give away a signed copy of your book. Uh, we're not going to uh, announce what the question will be, but there is a contest. So uh, make sure you stick around. And we both wanted to show sort of the book, but we don't have a physical copy laying around. You only have a Chinese copyright, and I only have the audio book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's the, there's the Chinese edition, so <laughs> it's, which is always interesting. But we are going to give away an English version, a signed copy, signed by you, uh, at the end of at least at the end of the episode. We're going to announce how you can participate in the raffle. Whew. Well, that was a stormy introduction, uh, Fred. Let's. Um, Let's dive into uh, the topic of making a conversation. I read, uh, I listened to the book. Um, uh, I found it fascinating. Uh, it got recommended to me by somebody, I don't recall who, sorry, but uh, it was one of those books on my list where I thought that I need to read this, I need to listen to this. And I got a lot of inspiration uh, from the book for the community that I host, for the cohorts that I host. So it was, um, it was very interesting and Again, I feel really privileged to be able to then sort of get people like you here on the show and pick your brain and go even deeper on this topic. Um, this is a long preamble for the question, uh, why do we need a book on conversations? Mark, it's a great question. And it's, I think it's so funny. Sometimes I'll go sit with clients and you'll, you'll say, like, we need to talk about how to have hard conversations or how to make a conversation. And everyone's like, do we really have to? I don't want to. And, and you're like, yeah, we really do have to. You know, Mark, I think there's a kind of couple things that, that kind of popped up that actually led to um, why we wrote the book. One 
One had to do, I think, with kind of civil discourse, and that's specifically in the United States. Um, we were we were at that point seeing a moment where it had kind of broken down. I think we would continue to see the kind of disenfranchisement and the fact that actually people, neighbors, community members, family members can't speak to each other. And so there on one level, there's that. Um, however, I would also say in my professional life, the last work I was doing was large scale systems change, working with the US government, then the Obama administration, working with uh, Elizabeth Warren, working with uh, the F Surgeon General, um, um, and as well, looking at large scale philanthropy and thinking about how they were talking to uh, nonprofits and talking to government and, to, and engaging with private sector and realizing that there was no real construction for conversations that that had the kind of impacts people wanted to have. You would see people going into rooms, talking, 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 but not getting impact, not making decisions that needed to happen. So that was a big drive. Like, how do we get decision making to happen? But it was also how do you get people to be involved in some of the most important conversations of their lives and do it in a way that feels creative and exciting as opposed to just feeling like a task. So those are the things that kind of like drove me to start to think about this topic. Um, and 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 Mark, interestingly, I mostly in the beginning would speak about how we had lost conversation in our culture as opposed to how we create it. So that was a big shift in my thinking um, over the time, over the last couple of years. So how did we lose conversation? What, what, what do you... Well, what, I mean, I believe, that that, yeah, I believe that there's a couple of kind of misperceptions. I think that if you were to ask people just naturally, one of the things that they might say right off the bat is, oh, it's technology, it's the phones, it's like, you know, whatever, it's it's political discord. Um, I would say there's a technology component, um, although I would say at least in the United States, actually in, in a lot of Europe as well, in the 50s, we saw the advent of television. Television basically became the de facto host of familial life. Um, and, and that actually, I think, had a big erosion in our ability to practice conversation, right? Because we weren't having conversations at dinner tables. And, and then I think there's a bunch of kind of things that happen in corporate practice. Uh, uh, we saw a, the huge move in the 70s of the self-actualization uh, movement into business, uh, which was kind of like me first. And I think that led to a really, really interesting um, kind of thing where conversation wasn't the most prized thing. Is like direct, powerful leadership was the thing that was prized most. Um, and then I think... Um, the other thing is that in we started getting into kind of tactics and things like what what I, I often I talk about in the book. There's a thing called active listening. Mark, I don't know if you're kind of aware of active listening. It's the idea of kind of saying yes, go on, please, whatever, which is actually in fact not listening. It's in fact built from a therapeutic technique. Um and so that actually got pulled into the world of HR, where suddenly we had a whole set of leaders who weren't listening to their employees. So it's kind of multi-pronged and multifaceted, I think, in, in a lot of ways. Okay, um, interesting to explore all of those things. Uh, the, the other, the very other interesting. <clears throat> the other question there is, um, why you? Like, of all the people who could write a book on conversations, why did you sort of feel? That it, that it was something you wanted or needed to create. Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting thing because when you start to kind of like craft a book um, and start to think about what like what you were going to to do, I think um, uh, you ask yourself that question exactly, which is like, why, why would it be me who, who writes this book? I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I had found myself in so many contexts. And in that case, many contexts that were globally significant, where we're dealing with kind of big issues, um, uh, governmental issues, things like that, where I'd watch the downfall of conversation or conversation not get where it needs to get. And so, and then I'd also seen how you could begin to think about applying design to conversation and get outside impact. Um, and so I was doing a lot of experimentation with new ways of doing conversation using designed formats and structures and realizing you could get so much more out of that. And so um, part of it had to do with the fact that it's like, I just had the experience of doing it and can actually practically begin to kind of give advice on how to think about it. What's interesting, Mark, is that I know about three other really remarkable authors who are also writing books on conversations now as well, because I think it is such a significant topic. All I would say from very different vantage points. Mine's a design perspective. For others, it's a science perspective or something like that. So it felt like it was the right thing for me. And last thing I'll say is that once you start to write a book, you realize your whole life has been, in essence, kind of stacked up to kind of like tell the story of what, how you can make the change or why you should be telling the story. So, I, We skipped over the part of um, uh, 
the fact that we are sort of losing conversations or finding it uh, difficult to have those hard conversations, um, maybe we can unpack that first before we uh, explore mm -hmm. the other areas. Like, so what is it from your perspective that is lost? Like, wh how is how are the conversations that we are having today different from I don't know when from your perspective we were still having the right conversations. Yeah. And, you know, I would say we've always like had moments where we've had, we've been less good or, or better at conversation. I will say that as we spend time, I spent time out in the world researching, historically, there were great examples of places where conversation really thrived in, in really significant ways. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot of it, I mean, time had a huge impact on it. As, as time speeds up, we actually don't get to have the kinds of conversations we need to have. And some of those are quite significant conversations. In the book, I talk about conversations that happen around mourning um, or crisis, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, and this, a real interesting example came up to me with a series of conversations I'd had at the White House post a very significant school shooting um, where I was in rooms where you felt like people couldn't even get to a definition of what it meant to think about gun violence in America, much less begin to think about how to solve for gun violence in America. And so that was a really, to me, um, significant example of a place where we needed to have a conversation that worked and at the same time it wasn't and so what, what, my question was like how could we actually begin to fix that um yeah i don't know if that begins to help him yeah so um uh, sort of the, the the definition or one of the criteria for you of a good conversation is a conversation that helps us make progress yes that it is. And I, recognizing that like not all conversations are meant to make progress. However, it's like, even if it's actually progress towards progress, like sometimes conversation, I mean, there are good conversations that are about helping people understand um, and embrace difference. One of the things I write about in the book is how kind of baseline afraid we are of walking into rooms where there's difference in the room and being worried about how to have those conversations, if that makes sense. I'm curious now, uh, who did you have in mind? I'm sort of firing questions at you at this no, point. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> who did you have in mind when you, when you were writing this book? I mean, it, we, we did really think it was for business leadership, I have to say. Like, that's kind of the, the, the way it plays. Although uh, something, a funny thing happened as I went through the book, which is initially when I was doing the research, I was doing work that was really looking at kind of spectacular conversationalists. So I went to um, Dharamshala and spent time with the Dalai Lama and went on pilgrimage to sort of see the kinds of conversations that happen as you walk um, for 50 miles, you know, a day or whatever, um, or 20 miles a day. And um, it was, I thought those would be the spectacular places where you would see, or global leaders, you know, I talked a lot with people who had led countries and things like that. And in the end of the day, the most interesting examples of people who'd had hard conversations creatively happened that um, happened to be held by like very um, kind of everyday people, people who basically had to kind of get through a hard conversation in their hometown or get through a hard conversation in their school. or in the, And so ironically, the inspiration started to come from kind of people who you would talk to around the corner. And so I think that actually shifted over time my perspective on who the reader was. And I actually, interestingly, the audience has kind of been weirdly expansive. So it's like there's people like yourself who kind of really live in a space where you could see how this applies to the business and work you do. And then there's people who do it to kind of figure out how to get through a conversation at the dinner table. And so what, what's been surprising is how that morphed both in the writing and then actually in the way it's been received as it's gone out in the world. I, I'm going to give you the impossible task to sort of summarize the the key idea or the key concept of making conversations. Like, uh, what is it? What? What? Yeah. What is? What is the key idea? Yeah, I th the key idea is that conversation is in fact a creative act. The key idea is that we don't believe we should be applying constructs to conversation. The conversation, in fact, we feel like should be natural. It should just be like, it should be something that flows. And that's actually not true. Um, in many cases, conversations don't flow or they don't get to the things we need to get. And so what the key idea of the book is, is you can apply design and creative thinking to conversations and build conversations that are going to feel more fun, more safe, um, more productive in, in, that, in that capacity. So the book has seven chapters, each one kind of outlining a different aspect of how you can use creativity to kind of have a better conversation. Um, but if you were to get to the essence, that's it. 
get creative about the conversations you have. Okay. Um, what are some ways to, to do that? Yeah, I'll go through a couple that I think are really interesting, or I'm going to go through some basics that I think you might not um, think about, which is that I have a whole second chapter, which is called creative listening, which is actually around the notion that we have, in fact, begun to think of listening as a as a punitive act, like you must listen to somebody or or um, I'm going to give somebody a good listening to, which is a way you hear people talk about listening to as well, which is like, it's if that sounds not fun. I don't know if that sounds fun to you, but to me, it doesn't. Um, and so there's a whole chapter that's about like, how do we reinstill joy into listening? How do we reinstill listening as a, as a fundamental, uh, fundamentally inspiration point for us as creatives or as designers or as practitioners of anything. And so, um, that's a, that's a key component. And there's some really interesting things. One of my favorite parts of the book is talking about what people like to listen to, which people like to listen to like gossip and secrets and like really short kind of clever stories. And so there's a whole section about how to tell short, clever stories, um, how to get people to tell you short, clever stories. Um, so that's a really significant component. I think the two others that I think are probably the most essential that when I teach this work, I, I it's, it becomes really critical is spotting scripts. So one of the things that happens in any kind of conversation is that there are scripts that are embedded in your conversation. And that can be scripts that are established by a room. That could be like, uh, if I say the word boardroom to you, you're gonna have a picture of what a boardroom looks like. And you can imagine what kinds of conversations are gonna be in that. That's a script, right? So one of the things that we get um, uh, people to do is be like, where, where am I kind of locked in a script that I don't wanna be in? Like, so is this a room I don't wanna be in? Is this a configuration I don't wanna be in? Does the agenda of a meeting, which is also the script of a meeting set the meetings that I can't even have the effects I want to have. So really getting good at finding um, embedded scripts and making sure you're not you're working with them or against them, if depending on how that plays. So that's the second big concept. And then the third one is that rules help us and that rules can change. And when we change the rules of conversation, we get really different kinds of conversations. And so again, we expect that rules stay consistent. In fact, rules, whenever you play with them, can give wildly divergent kind of outcomes to a conversation. Um, they can flip power dynamics. They can allow people to kind of say things they wouldn't say otherwise. And so we look a lot to games and gaming um, to kind of think about how you rethink the rules of conversation. So those are sort of three core components. And I'm happy to go into any of them deeper. But I can, maybe it is, it's uh, interesting to sort of uh, share how I listened to these key concepts and oh, how I... I yeah, how I'm trying to apply them. Um, and I think I can comment on all three, but uh, when you mentioned uh, like what kind of stories people want to uh, listen to, like the short stories, the gossips. And I think in the book you mentioned haikus as a way mm -hmm. to yeah. tell stories, sort of like the short poems. Uh, this is something that I uh, immediately try to incorporate in the community for in-house service designers where we do a two hour session. And at the end of the session now, I don't ask people for like, what is your takeaway? I sometimes do, but I try to ask the host to summarize the meeting in a haiku, right? That's so uh, funny. I love that. We're, we've had a two hour conversation with, I don't know, 20, 25 people, like summarize it in a haiku. And uh, this is still a prototype, but I, I love that. It's, I'm glad you like it. And what's funny, and I, I, you've, you've listened to the book, so you know, but it's like, we try to give you so many different ways to do something. So you can, if you don't like this way, you can try this way. And I love the haiku and I'm surprised at where people are using it. It's like shows up in places, which I, it's delightful to see. So I'm, that's great. I'd love to hear more about that at some point. I'd love to give you a second example of, yeah. uh, with regards to the scripts, because when I think initially of scripts, I'm thinking like the call center, somebody who takes you through a, a right, list, right. but you mentioned it's also about context. And I was like, okay, um, in my days when I was still doing service design, we were very aware of the room and the, like the physical setting of the room, what kind of uh, vibe that would set. Nowadays, I do most of my things online. So I was thinking like, what what signals is the online space giving for the conversations that we're having? And it's, I guess <laughs> it's funny because our community is called The Circle and you talk in the book about a circle. Um, yeah. And I was reimagining the way we sort of organize our online space to make it less um, linear 
and to, to make it more circular for, I don't know if that's the proper word here. So for instance, that's an example of how I'm trying to apply these principles into a, a virtual environment to, to script the conversations or set the stage for a certain type of conversation, certain type of dynamic. I love that. I love that. And I think it's a great example of like, you know, that there all the different ways that scripts can play and then how you can start to craft the scripts that you want to have. And that's, I mean, it's interesting. I don't know where you're, you're thinking as you're going on that, but immediately when you said that, I start to think about, well, what are the structures of a two hour conversation? And would you want the conversation to end where it begins? Because that's kind of like, it's bringing it all around as a circle. I mean, are there time ways to think about circular? So yeah. And I think the whole point about that, Mark, is like, why not get creative with it? Why not see if there can be something better? Because we know this, the baseline is not that great. So we might as well get better if we can. Well, that there is something, uh, I think, romantic about the notion like, yeah, conversations should be organic and they should uh, be quite spontaneous. Uh, if, if they are, you're lucky. Uh, but you can do a lot to sort of increase the chance that more fruitful, better conversations happen. I think that's the key. Yeah. I mean, and that's, uh, you, Mark, I, that's a great point. And one that I really, I want to kind of hone in on for a moment, which is that gossip, whispering, you know, late night conversations, all those things, those are amazing. Don't touch those. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the ones that you make, make you a little bit nervous, or you feel like there needs to be impact, or you know, the group needs to connect and bond. So it's the ones where there's actually, there's something at stake that we feel like we want to kind of think about creatively, if that makes sense. And, and there is one more thing here is, um, and it has to do with time. Like when you get people into a virtual or physical room for two hours, you want to sort of get quote unquote, the most out of it. it. It doesn't have to be like productive, but it can also be like fun, inspiration, connection. And, and I guess that's what you are designing for. You want to get the most value. I think that's right. And and Mark, I just I think it's even let, let's just sort of let's pause for a moment and recognize the moment we're in, which is that most people for the last couple of years have not been experiencing fun in Zoom context or have not experienced hard conversations that can be fun. And so the outsized benefit, if you can add a little bit to 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 that, is it is felt remarkably. I'll tell you one of the simplest things that I do in my meetings, which is like if it's an hour meeting. If it's a 90 minute meeting, if it's a 30 minute meeting, whatever, um, we almost always try to end our meetings five minutes early. And the reason why is that there's this moment of delight when suddenly you're like not running up against something, but you're like, you surprise somebody with an extra five minutes. So dumb, Mark, and yet so powerful. Um, and, and really, you just sort of see the kind of this joy when you're like, I have a saying that every time a meeting ends early, an angel gets its wings, and everyone's just like, "Yes!" It's like so basic things can have to, can make things more fun. Actually, so. it's it's interesting that we are uh, discussing a lot of things that are sort of setting again the stage for the conversation, not the actual conversation itself, right? Right. That's right. Well, and that's that's the point, Mark, because what we're looking for are tools and armatures and themes that actually can be used across multiple kinds of conversations and or the right tools for the right kinds of conversations. So, um, so yeah, it's really my, my, one of the things I kind of discovered very early as I was writing is like, I'm not a facilitator. I don't think as like a facilitator, like it's like, I think like a designer, which is like, let's make the structures that make a conversation better. So it really is all those pieces, not the conversation itself. Yes. And, and exactly, and this has to, uh, there is a very easy link to be made with, for instance, things like experience or customer experience. You cannot force somebody how they will feel in a certain environment, or you cannot force certain conversations upon people. What you can do is you can <clears throat> set the stage and then hope, <laughs> increase the chance that the conversations that need to happen will happen. It's it's why I was so delighted to talk to you and kind of to the people who are listening, um, which is that it's like it, it, you are in essence conversation designers, really. I mean, the, in, the, in the sense that, that that it's like all those things, like the kind of the structures, the products, the scripts, the people, the, like everything, all those things that kind of come around a service design process is in fact constructing the kinds of conversations that happen. So I don't see your work as being that dissimilar from the work that we do, frankly. I uh, thank you for labeling it. Uh, or one of the areas that I do, because when you, when I, I think you mentioned in the book, like conversation design, or I, I wrote the term somewhere, I was like, yeah, that, that is 
like a very big part of how I spend my day and the things I'm thinking about, like creating that stage. I have a I have a different question for you, and it okay, has please. to do with with the with the beef you have around active listening. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you uh, discuss that a bit yeah, uh, more I in depth? It, but I'm going to go into it in detail because it's actually kind of a really it's an interesting thing. So I, I'm going to tell you. I know you listen to the book, but I'm going to tell you like um, the origins of active listening are funny. So um, there was a therapist in the 40s, 50s named Carl Rogers, really remarkable therapist. Um, originally a psychoanalyst, um, had at that point in his career kind of started to feel that. Um, that psychoanalysis had like limitations around its ability to kind of help people kind of forecast their their feelings and understand their their kind of traumas. And so he created this thing called person-centered therapy, which I think is quite funny if you think about person-centered therapy. And the idea was the therapist's job was to ask questions that helped you as the person who is responding just uncover your own problems. So it's kind of like the classic, if you see a movie of a therapist, I'll be like, how are you doing today? You're like, you're like, not so good. I'm like, why you're not so good? And you're like, well, I'm depressed. And I'll say, why are you depressed? And you're like, well, I can't set any goals. And I'll say, why can't you set any goals? And it's just this really recursive way that's always going back to you as a speaker. That's called active listening now. Active listening got pulled into everything. It got pulled into the way politicians talk. It got pulled into the way... Um, Companies talk to each other. It got like it was. It's been taught in leadership. If you, if you Google listening, you're most likely to come up with something like active listening as the primary thing, and active listening in the context where where is not it's not a two way practice. Active listening is one way. I'm encouraging you to talk. I'm not even listening necessarily. I'm just encouraging you to talk. So it's for you, the speaker. It's not for me as the listener, and that makes listening. It's like you took listening out into the yard and like you know, hit in with a rock. It's just like, it's like, why, like, it's not giving listening the merits it needs to have. So what I think about with creative listening is like, let's then think about how to kind of re-embrace the joy of listening, the creativity of listening, you as somebody who can listen and ask questions as a listener, um, as opposed to think that it's actually this kind of like, let me just be here for you. Kind of thing. Yeah, the, the, you're almost like a chatbot uh, without... Yeah. Well, and in fact, um, interestingly, like MIT in like the, I think the seventies built the very, one of the very first chat boxes and bot bots. And it was actually built off the notion of an active listening therapist. So it was called Eliza and it would basically do therapy, but it would do therapy basically like just sort of like the way we just discussed. And so it, it in fact, maybe was the origin of the way we think about chat bots. So. When you describe this, I, I have to think back of how we used to do design research when I was still doing service design projects and uh, design research is like a lot of people read it and or, or uh, subconsciously practice active listening. Uh, they want to be unbiased and like you want to hear the stories from the uh, uh, interviewee. I took a different approach at some point and I was like, I'm going to instill my own experience. I'm going to make it into a conversation rather than an interview. Right. And I found that always more enjoyable. And usually it got, I think it got me better results. So, yeah, I, th I think what's interesting is even as researchers and, you know, I, I, I work with design researchers, but I work with researchers like in the academic context. In fact, I was just training up a group in Australia, a bunch of academics on a, a new research methodology. And I think you hit a really good point, which is that to ask ourselves to be unbiased is a pretty unnatural state to go into a conversation. To hold a bias is problematic, but it's like one of the things that I think is interesting, especially if you're a designer, if you're a service designer, or you're doing this kind of work, is like, it's okay to judge. Um, and then it's okay to be like, well, but hold on, put that judgment aside. So I, I think to ask yourself to not act human makes listening terrible. And so I think what you're saying is exactly right. It's like you're, you're letting yourself be human. And then in that situation you're probably getting more human response from the people that you're talking to that's it and i there's like uh i don't know maybe it's it's the the idea of having to be scientific or objective and uh i, I don't know where that came from but like being human is probably more important in our context than being scientific well yeah i'll give you an example so i'm working with a client that's kind of working on a strategy project and um and they keep sort of being like, well, it's like, we want to make sure that we're getting bias. We're not getting, we're removing all of our bias from our interviews. And I was like, hey guys, your strategy isn't 
objective. Like it's not an apple. You just don't go pick it off a tree. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's actually somewhat subjective. You have to feel your strategy forward. So yes, get as much information and facts as you can, but at some point you're responsible for it. You have to feel like you're going to own it. And, um, it's actually been really, I think, open eye-opening for people. We're like, oh yeah, I can feel my strategy, not just like make my strategy. So, um, is the essence of creative listening listening to be more human, or like, how would you summarize that? I mean, it's it's what what, what the the essence of creative listening is to give you so many more tools you have to try listening in a bunch of different ways. Um, and so it's a um, and and but a lot of that though does rely on being human. You know, it does like so. I talk about a thing called I talk about Quaker listening, which is a point of inspiration for me, which is sort of silent incubatory listening, and that touches into a very deep kind of human nature. It also I would say the other aspect of what we look at in creative listening is how do you listen in the ways that allow us to think most creatively. And so one of the reasons I talk about like moments of pause or silence or taking breaks from things is that we know from the psychology of creativity that our minds make more connections in quiet moments than they do when we're in conversation moments. We're actually more likely to be connecting things. So there's real creative value to listening to something in silence than necessarily kind of like not or taking a moment of silence. So it's a bunch, there's a creative listening has a bunch of different methods you can use to kind of let us kind of be more creative with the way we think about listening. I'm, I'm an easy audience for you, right? I, I sort of, uh, as eat, eat this, uh, ideology, uh, for breakfast. I love this. This, this resonates very strongly with me. Now, you mentioned that you work with many different people, with business leaders, with country leaders. Is there a pattern in how they respond to these ideas? Um, right now, I would say that most of what we get is relief and surprise. Um, so a bit of this notion that like, I didn't know it could be fun. I didn't know it could be interesting. One of the things that I'm finding, and I, I'm going to actually give you, I'll tell you some examples of some negative responses as well. But what I, the most surprising thing in the last year is how often now our clients have started to refer to our conversation structures or the conversations that they have as games. Um, and it's really interesting because it's like, it's not how we design them. But I was talking to a friend of mine who's the head of McKinsey Quarterly who had done an interview with me a while back ago. And I was like talking to him recently and I was like, why are they calling these things games? And he was like, well, games have results, games have rules, and games are fun. And that's what your conversation structures are. And I was like, okay, I, so I'll go with it. So that's mostly the kind of response we've had. And I've been amazed at how much that kind of hits. I think because people want that. However, I had a very interesting experience last week where I was working with a client and it was the entire C-suite of a client. And... The very top level, the, C the CEO hated the conversation structure, hated the game that they played. Um, and in conversation afterwards with him and others, um, part of what we realized, and he was fine with it when, when he realized it, is that it's because the conversation structure leveled the playing field. It meant that everybody had the ability to have a, the same kind of conversation, but it wasn't that this one person could dominate the CEO just because of their power. And so it became a really interesting thing, which is that if you're suddenly feeling like your work is being, or you can't do what you usually do, which is just make the final decision or just like jump ahead or talk over people, then it's uncomfortable. Um, but it is un uncomfortable in a learning way as well. So. What are some of the other common roadblocks you see and experience when people try to implement this? Um, actually, a lot of it, frankly, the biggest kind of roadblocks are people being afraid to assert what they want to do and then not doing it and not getting the benefit. So I have clients who've come back being like, sometimes we didn't do what you said and sometimes we did. And it was always better when we did what you said, but it's still we were afraid to do some of these things. So, And I'm going to give you an example. I have a client. I was just teaching this client um, the value of silence and why you might hold five minute moments of silence where people kind of quietly write ideas in the middle of a meeting in a conversation. And that client was like, I can't do that. That's so uncomfortable. People are so uncomfortable in silence. And so what I have to do in a situation like that is be like, first of all, that's the point is that you're working with the discomfort of silence. But then you have to kind of give sort of like the science behind silence. Like why does silence work and what does it do for us? And so what I find most, and my team, I have a neuroscientist on my team. My team is now prepped for us to be able to kind of say like, if we're going to ask you to do this, here's all 
the evidence that says this is the right thing to do. So if you're going into a room, Mark, and you're with these very senior people and you're doing something awkward, you can say, here's the reason we're doing it. And so that helps a ton. And so that's something I've really been working on. That's awesome because otherwise it's just, uh, um, it, it leans towards the art side, right? Uh, psychology, I don't know, no, not psych, that's a, that's a bad example, but it leans towards art and feeling. Well, um, business leaders and company leaders, they are sort of more uh, analytical people. They try to right. have control and you, you sort of need to give them what they want to engage with this. And if this is going to give them scientifically proven better results, then I'm sure they'll they'll go for it. Exactly. Because what you want to do is like you want them to do it once, because what you find is once you do it once, you're like, that's amazing. It's be- it's just better. And you start- then you feel it. But it's like it's it's totally fair for people to be like, I need to know it. I need to understand like how this works before I actually try it. So that's a lot of the work that we do is now is make sure that if people are afraid to have a conversation, for instance, where people move around the room, which is something that we do, then we give them the reasons why that works. And then they do it and then they, they'll they never not have a conversation like that. So it's it's a bit kind of just like unlocking those barriers is the work that we're doing the most right now. One, um, and you address this in the final chapter of the book, but one of the questions I had while I was reading through it is like, um, conversation might be interpreted uh, initially as we need to do, we need to talk. And like in my design practice, I learned that people often cannot verbally articulate the things they want, they need, um, uh, but you address that in the final chapter. Like, could you share a bit uh, about that, like like how conversation isn't just about talking. Yeah. You 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 hit my kind of one of my favorite realizations during the book. Um, so I, in essence, the I think the last chapter is called create. Um, and uh, in essence, the foundation of that chapter is when you can't talk, don't. In fact, instead, do together. Um, and so, and. What's interesting, and I, I was thinking about it for your um, practice and the people that you're working with, um, which is that, um, and and your that your listeners, which is, if you're a service designer, you can talk and talk and talk about the work that you do. Whereas if you can take somebody into an experience and be like, "This is service design," like let's experience it together, then it probably clarifies so much more. And what we find is that when we do things together, like we create the same bonds. In fact, sometimes we create stronger bonds. You might create stronger bonds by going for a hike or cooking with somebody than you do it by having a conversation. Stronger bonds when you make something together than when you, by the conversation. So if making something together both helps you get someplace, further clarifies something and builds bonds, then it's okay as a replacement for conversation. So that's really what the final chapter is about. And I will tell you, Mark, the biggest surprise for me is how often people have been like, this helped me with my mom, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, you know, or this, this helped me with my family or it's like, it's like, it's so interesting, like how people are, have been interpreting and using it in different contexts. So. I I love, I'm really happy that you added that chapter, uh, because it needs to be, uh, if you're not coming from a design background, I think it's really easy to overlook, uh, and, and just focus on talking while doing is probably in in some situations more valuable uh i can give you again an example how i yes. how i was immediately trying to uh replicate and implement this in my community uh in our community i should say so um what i took out of creating things together is that it's a way to for instance uh create deeper connections right and uh we meet once a month for two hours like that's okay you can build connections there but it's just two hours now we came up with the idea to create a publication as a group at the end of the year so everybody is going to contribute uh, to a single thing a single artifact that we're going to put into the world Um, and i really believe uh, we'll have to wait and see Uh, again it's a prototype but that is going to create stronger bonds within this group by co-creating something that we together as a community put out into the world. So that that was how you inspired me through that chapter to, to implement this. 
Well, thanks. I think that's actually a really smart idea. I think what's also interesting about what you're doing is that you're also you're 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 taking this group, but there's a goal suddenly ahead of them, which means that they're all going in the same direction for the the point of this year, which is also profoundly impactful in the ways that bonds and connections are made. So you're, there's a lot of clever things you're doing there. I think so. And uh, it's it's not it's not hard. Like you just have to be mindful of it. Like you just have to see the opportunity, and then uh, it's again. It's really funny that you say that, Mark, because you're, you're so. <laughs> When you sell a book, you, you get a bunch of like you talk to a bunch of different publishers and you go meet with the different publishers. And the way I ended up working with my publisher is I was sitting with her and she was like, well, in my estimation, your book is really mindfulness for conversation. And I was like, oh, my God, that's totally what it is. And that's why I ended up going with her as my publisher, because I just felt like she was able to articulate it, which is like once you're aware of it, once you think about it, once you think about other places where you've seen conversations go well, you have a whole palette of things you can pull to use to kind of create conversations anew. So it's, I think that's a really nice articulation of it. You, um, and we are sort of branching off in different uh, areas, uh, but uh, you mentioned, I, when did you start writing the book? Let me first ask that. Was it prior to COVID or was it during COVID? Oh yeah, no, it was well prior. It was, uh, I, I was starting, I started writing it, like I started doing the proposal in 2017. Um, most of my research and actually, the reason, oh, Mark, the book was done um, pre, pre-COVID. pre In fact, the only thing that happened is that in December, I remember sitting with my publisher and I was like, we both were like, I think there's going to be a pandemic. We're going to push the book out a year. So we pushed the book out a year. Um, and then, and so it, so yeah, it was, it was well, it was packed and done. Now, knowing death, uh, that you wrote it uh, prior to COVID, if you could add an additional chapter to the book uh, based on the last two years. Like, what would that chapter be about? Well, it's funny. I, I'll i tell you a funny thing. So um, March or February of the first year of COVID, my publisher called me and she was like, we need to add a very short chapter on how to have the hardest conversations of your life in the pandemic over Zoom. And so interestingly, I had the opportunity then to add a very short chapter, which is really the kind of conclusion of the book, which is like, hey, right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. We have to do this. Here's the five things you should think about as you kind of um, are navigating these kinds of hard conversations in this new way, which is interesting, Mark, because I wrote that again, three years ago or whenever that was. And um, we still use it. I mean, I use it to this day as the kind of the, the kind of guidelines for the ways we think about having hard conversations in a kind of mediated environment. So um, I was lucky enough to be able to add the chapter um, in the middle of the process. It was rough because it's like you have to stay within page limits and stuff like that. But it's, it was it was interesting. Maybe I, I didn't catch that chapter uh, in the audiobook. I, you must have. It's it was it was it's very short. It's like the very last thing, and it, and it has like five things to do. And unfortunately, because I only have my Chinese edition in front of me, I can't like tell you where it is. So uh, uh, let's assume that I somehow skipped over it. Like, do you recall what are these things that you added in that chapter? Yeah, and so interestingly, they were sort of based on the things that were in the other chapters. So one of the first things is commit or don't. And so the idea behind that was like. You're busy. If you can't make a conversation on Zoom, don't because you're just making the conversation easier for everybody else and you're making your life easier by kind of kind of making your time more simple. And so the idea was like, if you're not needed someplace right now, don't do, don't go so that other people can make the work affect the work they want to do. I think one of the more profound ones was um, choose the medium for the conversation you want to have. So don't assume Zoom is always the conversation with the place to have a conversation. When is the phone appropriate? When can you actually get the same progress in a Google Doc? So it was really about kind of like breaking open the notion that conversation had to happen face to face in in a, in a mediated environment. But but you know, we knew we know phone conversations are remarkably powerful. And so there's a whole section on mediums and then and then basically like reestablishing the rules of conversation. See if you can find it. I wonder if it's not in the audiobook. It's but it's it's a it's a great fun little chapter. Now, uh, I don't know if you're planning on already doing uh, a revision or uh, a part two or a sequel. Mm -hmm. um, my question would be like, what's next? What have you sort of learned uh, by going through this process? Yeah. Um, so I'll, it's that's a really great question. Um, I'll. I'll tell you something that I learned that I probably could have learned 
five years ago, that, <laughs> which, cause it's, which is that when I was writing the book, I was with my agent one day. My agent was like, the book really should just be a whole book on listening. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, it's like, I, I have a whole thing on, on all the aspects of conversation. I want to write that. And then I will say this last year, I was kind of driving home from the city and realized that she was not wrong. She was right. That actually there needs to be a book that's just on listening and the practices of listening and, and the extremities of how you can do listening in really fascinating and new ways and what to listen to. So um, I've got two things I'm working on. One is that is a book that's actually looks at like, how, how do we become more aware in a deeper way? Um, and then another one that's actually a little bit more fun, which is how to think about communicating your work if you're creative to non-creative people so that's actually that's more of a fun thing this is also going into that's i'm doing an online course that will be on that as well so uh, those two things will kind of go side by side i like those topics <laughs> yeah, I those you might, to <laughs> <laughs> yeah those topics resonate with me for sure i, I, um, I suspect it as much <laughs> Now, um, maybe sort of uh, heading towards the end of our conversation, um, what do you feel is maybe the biggest misconception people have around this topic? Um, well, the, it, I, I think that the um, you actually targeted it already, which is like, I think that people, the misconception on the topic is that it's an art or a talent, right? That it's like, that you know, as you said, it's like, that, that it, it's something that it's like, you're just really good at, or you're just like, you know, you know, whatever, or it's, whereas like, what I believe is that anyone can do this if they have the kind of right, right things. And so it's actually for, for me, it's a, it's a construct, it's rules and it's practice. Um, and those are the things that get you there. So that's the big difference in the way that I think about it. And maybe other people come to this topic initially. And, and the great thing about that is that, uh, you can get better at this, like, that's that's a great thing. You can it's a skill. You can practice. You can learn. You can prototype. You can iterate. You can get better, and you will you will get better once you know which way you need to go. And Mark, what you'll find is as you get better, you get more out of conversation. You find more to love about the the conversations you have. So it it it, it rewards profoundly. And that's I guess part of the game mechanism uh because there's yeah. like the self-reinforcing uh system there <laughs> totally yeah you um, little, 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 little rush you get from like from succeeding in something like that so yes what do you hope is the one thing somebody will take away from our chat if they remember one thing what do you hope it is you know uh, it's i have two things which is like i think i hope people are taking away that it's that that Hard conversations don't have to be as hard as they seem if you actually start to think creatively about it. Because it's like, I want people to feel like they are empowered to have those conversations. Um, and then I hope that people are reminded that um, at its core, um, conversations should be an inspiration point, not like a point of kind of like, you know, uh, fear. And so it's like, it's like, I want people to be like, how can I get the most inspiration from the conversation I have, which will then I think make them ask, how then do I get the most creative about the conversations I have? So that's the thing that I would hope people take away. Love it. Uh, and there are so, so many areas where to apply this, not just your professional life, but your personal life as well. And I think that's the next frontier for me. Like it's really easy for me to implement this like professionally, but now I, I need to implement this with my wife and my kids. <laughs> you can do it. It's, it's amazing how many like even the more formal games that we have that people have then taken home and played with their families, which is fascinating. So hmm. now before we leave off, there's one super important thing we need to do. Uh, we need to announce the contest. So uh, the way this works, uh, and regular listeners to the show uh, know uh, what's coming. Um, we're going to, you're going to announce uh, a question, and uh, we want the answer to that question uh, either somewhere below this uh, episode or in the related post. I'll uh, add the details to the show notes. Uh, and uh, if you give the right answer, you will enter a raffle and uh, make a chance to win a signed copy. Now, all the details again are in the show notes, but uh, Fred, what is the question that people need to answer to participate? I think it, we'll see, it's either easy or hard, but um, the name of the book is Making Conversation, The Seven Essential Elements of, Com of Meaningful Communication. How many chapters are in the book? 
All right. That that is like a catch twenty two because maybe they don't, they don't have the books, <laughs> but then <laughs> <laughs> but, but they have enough clues. I promise they, they have know. enough clues. If you listen to this episode, you should be able to know. And uh, uh, you'll know that the last chapter is about creating. Um, once again, uh, thank you for making the time coming on. Thank you for taking the time to write this to capture your thoughts because we all have so many ideas that we want to share uh, with the world. But uh, not everybody sits down, has the courage to lock themselves up and, and write a book about it. So uh, thank you uh, for doing that. And I hope our conversation will continue uh, from this point on. Me too, Mark, and thanks so much for reaching out. It's always a delight to talk um, with, with new people about the work. So, If you want to participate in the contest and make chance to win a signed copy of Fred's book, leave a comment down below answering the question, how many chapters does the book have? For all the details about the contest, make sure to also read the show notes. Thanks so much for listening to the Service Design Show, and I look forward to see you in the next video. 